Cousineau started his own group in Paris. And the experiments were done by Jean-Léon Met, who also got his own group in, in uh, the institute next to Hervé in Paris. So I'm looking forward to their future collaboration. But this was the work uh, we did with Takashi Hiragi. So he's a uh, mostly a mouse embryologist in, in EMBL. And Ritsuya helped with the experiments. And so morphogenesis is this uh, very ambitious uh, question in biology, you want to explain the shape of plants and animals and humans. So here we take a mouse, and because we are very modest in the beginning, we take the very earliest events in the life of the mouse. So you start from a single cell, uh, which is round, and the cell will divide. And here you can see the, the two cells are uh, confined inside the the envelope, which is a jelly coat. And so they are pushed against each other, but there's no, it's just physics at this stage. There's no chemistry in the system. And the cell will divide again, makes a tetrahedron in space. Again, this is just a symmetry breaking that's imposed by the confinement. And then you go into eight cells, and there something else happened, which is due to the activity of the cell. It's not just elements, you know, physical elements in a confined geometry, but they do something else. And this is called compaction. You can see it in 3D here. So you have the edge cells that are initially uh, just compressed against each other. And then they adhere. So the, the contact zone expand. And they, these eight cells will look more like a, a sphere together. So this is called compaction. And it's due to some activity in the cytoskeleton of this cell. So here we, we move away from physics to just uh, object confined. And, and have some activity which is due to the protein inside. So we looked at this specifically. And so again, this is a very uh, modest approach to embryogenesis, but of course we, we all dream that you know in 20 years from now, uh, we're gonna be able to explain the shape of an animal. And of course, I will conclude this part by saying that every, at every stage of the process, you need to add more complexity into the system. So the cells become more complex, and so there's really a a national challenge ahead of us, you know, and so it's going to be more and more complicated. We're going to, you know, I'll come back to that later. But uh, the reason to look at this system now is also because there's outstanding microscopy being done on this small system. So here you see in 3D confocal microscope, you can get the volume of all these cells in 3D and in time. And with light sheet microscopy, you can actually do that over weeks. And so we start to have the information that is needed to test the model and develop these, these physical models. Now, what we do is extremely simple because we look at the early stages. And uh, this whole process of compaction we can see here takes uh, several hours. And so we can treat it as a quasi-static uh, system. Can you, can you hear me? You need to adjust something. Sorry. All right. Yeah, is it better? Yeah. Okay, so it's quasi static. So at every time point, there's equilibrium of forces in the system. So that's very good. And then, uh, as you can see on this image, if you look at the contacts between any two cells, it remains flat. Which says a very important fact is that the, the the two cells, these two cells are symmetric. You know, if there was in particular a difference of pressure between the two cells, the interface between them would, would be a curved. And that's not the case at this stage. It's the case later on, but not at this stage. So here we can consider that all the cells are equivalent. And so that brings us back to the uh, physics of sub-bubbles, which is from 19th century, um, Plateau, Belgian physicist. And he observed, for instance, the rule that all the contacts between uh, interfaces are characterized by angles of 120 degrees, which is uh, 2 pi over 3. And this you get because you have an equilibrium of forces between the interface here and this other interface and the third interface. So you have three interfaces, and the forces are equal. The tensions are exactly equal on these three interfaces. And therefore, you get 120 degrees, always. And this is true because the surface tension, 
which is the, the tension buildup in this interface, is the same everywhere in a system of bubbles when the bubbles are in contact. In fact, there's a single fluid, by la fluid layer, and so this is in equilibrium with that, which is equilibrium with that, and everything else in the system. So there's only one gamma, and so to calculate the configuration of two bubbles, what you have to do is to minimize uh, effective energy, which is simply the surface tension times the area, and because the surface tension gamma is the same for all the area, you can take it out of the, the sum, and then you, you simply need to minimize the surface, the sum of the surface, given that the volume of air inside the bubble is trapped, and so remain constant. So that's very nice physics, and you can do a lot of interesting math, you know, minimal surfaces on this, but you can, you can write a very simple equation. And we're lucky enough to be able to use a similar equation in the case of embryos, except that the gammas are not the same in every part of the system. So here we have to move a step ahead of the bubble physics and invent the physics of the embryo by just saying gamma is not equal everywhere. And the reason is that if you have two cells in... two bilayer in contact, first of all, so the two cells don't fuse, they just are next to each other, the, the uh, E. cadherine and other proteins will make uh, bridges between the two membranes and then uh, these ecaterines will actually talk to the cytoskeleton and change the tension in there. And so the tension gamma CC at the contact zone is different from gamma CM where the cells are contacting the media. But nevertheless, for a doublet, you can write the equation very simply. So here you have an energy which will be the outer surface area times gamma CM times 2 plus the area in the center and if you assume that it's axisymmetric, which it should be, with two blood, with two cells, you have um, this other energy term with gamma CC. And you can write the equation, you describe the system with a few angles, you write the equation, you can solve everything analytically. This is described in the paper of Hervé. So you can, you can calculate the configuration of the system. And uh, what's remarkable is that Experimentally, you can take an embryo at the eight cell stage and you can come with a pipette and pick one cell out and another cell out and put them back together. So you make a doublet and this doublet of cell recapitulates the same process as the eight cell in the normal embryo. So it seems that the process of compaction here is uh, fully recapitulated by individual cells or doublet of cell. So if you have a doublet of cell here, you can see in the beginning of compaction, they are next to each other, but the contact zone is small. And then the contact zone increase and the contact angle uh, becomes more flat. And this is entirely described by this little theory with two surface tension, which predicts the contact angle being the ratio of these uh, two surface tension, gamma CC over gamma CM. So we have an extremely simple uh, theory with here uh, uh, two parameters, uh, the gamma CM coming with a pipette. So you can come with a pipette, you apply a known depressure inside the pipette, you suck a piece of the cell to make a, exactly half a sphere, and from that applying a Laplace law, I won't show the algebra but it's really simple, uh, you can deduce gamma CM but I want to stress not in arbitrary unit, like, like in many biological uh, problems, but re in real units of tension um, in there. So we have here uh, tension in piconewton per micrometer, and you can see that these cells, as they compact, they increase the gamma CM. Okay? And uh, we cannot measure gamma CC using the same technique, because this is, we'll need the pipette to go through the cell, which we cannot do. But we can measure the angle theta, and using the formula, we can deduce gamma CC. So we can deduce the, all the parameters in the system. And here, uh, we can uh, account for that, saying that the compaction occurs because gamma CM increase. So that's a very interesting message biologically, because it means, you know, in very simple terms, the two cells don't adhere 
because they like each other more. They adhere because they dislike being alone. It's slightly different. So the gamma CM increase, and so they, they want to reduce the surface area, and the solution is to stick and make a sphere together. What stops that is that another process starts. Uh, so they compact up to a certain stage, and then division, the eighth division kicks in, and then you have 16 cells, and they become asymmetric. So that's just what I wanted to say. So here, uh, we could explain the compaction at eight cell stage using uh, uh, doublets, but the whole system behaves essentially the same way. And here we have a system in which uh, the cell have inhomogeneous properties, so there is a gamma CC, which is a part of the cell which is in contact, and a gamma CM, which is a part of the cell which is uh, with the media. But it's the same cell, it's just different parts of the body, whether they feel or not a neighbor. So this is the system, but all the cells are still identical. Now, what kicks in is the division, which gives you 16 cells, but in addition, these 16 cells are some of them are different because the division are asymmetric at this stage. You know, and that's a simple consequence of having the cells polarized here because they have a, a gamma. You know, the cells have one area in contact, and when they divide along this axis, then uh, the two daughter cells inherit different material. So having a division after an asymmetric cell gives you asymmetric different cells. And so here the cells become different. You start to have gamma CM and gamma CM prime, so two different kinds of gamma CM. But the same physics can be applied, except you have more different kinds of tensions to minimize in your sum. And later on, I'm not going to say anything about it, but to make the blastocyst, you start making a cavity. So the cell start pumping uh, fluid through their pore uh, so that, that that will be space for the embryo, and the embryo will develop here. And this is the placenta. Um, so to model the asymmetric cell doublets, so the internalization of, at the 16 cell stage, we have again the same kind of theory, except we have now three surface tension and a priori two volumes. And you can again experimentally recapitulate the process by taking cells with a pipette but now you can take them from different embryos, which are at different cell stage. And so you can have cells which are uh, symmetric, like before, or cells which are asymmetric. And then what happens is that one of the cells will be internalized inside the other one. Which is what happened in the embryo, but it's not one cell that goes inside another cell. It's four cells that go inside the 12 other cells. But physically, the process can be described in the same way. So I'm, I'm going, not going to show you the algebra, but again, here it's a limit where you can still do things on paper. So we have here three surface tension, two volumes. We can derive three adimensional parameters, and we can make a phase diagram, a complete phase diagram analytically, and it shows that we need compaction. And once you compact, then if you increase the tension asymmetry, you can internalize. But if you would change the volume asymmetry, it wouldn't suffice, because the angles are determined by the tension, the ratio of tension, and the volume has nothing to do with that. So the only way to internalize is to change the ratio of tension. So, and, and this, the analytical solution was made on doublet of cell, because you have axial symmetry, and so you can describe everything with a few angles, and, and do everything on paper. Now, what we did is to develop a numerical method uh, to do the same thing with 16 cells. So this is done numerically, but it's the same equations. So it's the same energy that we minimize. And you can verify that the implementation numerical solution is faithful to the model because you get the same thing for a doublet. And then you can use the simulation to extrapolate what's going to happen with 16 cells. Yes. Yeah, we think the membrane doesn't play too much of a role. I will. Yeah, but the, uh, so I'll come to that. But the surface tension comes from the cortex and not from the membrane. Okay, so I'll make a point about this so, in just a minute. 
And uh, so here you can reproduce the internalization of one cell. It goes inside the, the blob formed by the other one uh, just because it has a different tension. So this is a case of, of cell sorting. It's been described in the, uh, many years ago with cell in culture. And we think probably the same thing happens in embryo here at this stage. Yeah, so we, um, so compared to, uh, so, I mean, mathematically it's going to be the same. So we minimize a formula which is gamma times surface area. And uh, people will say adhesion energy will go in this term in the Hamiltonian. So it depends on how you write your Hamiltonian. But uh, let me say something about this. So I'm going to answer the, the two questions you raised. Okay. Switching to uh, the next topic, so uh, wait. So let, here's what we think. So here we have a cell doublet, and um, in blue we have the plasma membrane, so the lipid bilayer, and below it the cortex. So the cortex is a cytoskeletal structure made of actin filaments crossing by molecular motors and cells. Now we know for measurements that the typical tension in the plasma membrane is a few piconewton per meter, whereas the tension in the cortex is uh, two orders of magnitude higher. We know that directly for measurements uh, by AFM, so you take a cell and you, you press on it, you can measure the force and the deformation, so you can conclude the tension. And you add a drug that depolymerizes actin, and then they floppy. And then you see the surface, uh, the, the cortex, sorry, the plasma membrane tension, these five peak And uh, you, can, uh, you can see it in different ways. So there are two recent papers in which you have measurement. And so it means that in terms of shape, what really matters is the cortex and not, not the plasma membrane, not the tension in the plasma membrane. This is at least true in animals at this stage. You know, in the plants, it's totally different because you have the cell wall, which is the toughest material outside the cell. And um, maybe in some um, organism without the cortex, then maybe the plasma membrane is, is what matters, but not in, in embryo. Now, you, your question was... Whether you can describe this as some kind of effective differential adhesion. So here we have, I have a little cartoon of uh, tension and adhesion. So in the Hamiltonian, you will typically have a term that's proportional to the area. Okay? And I would say this has more to do with the forces parallel to the membrane in this part, so the cortex, whereas the adhesion would be uh, keeping those cells together. So if you imagine adhesion being driven by this e caterine you could actually change the surface area by compacting, making the ecaterin a little more dense. That wouldn't change anything in the energy. Whereas if you change the area, the, the actin cortex really has to contract or not. So I think it depends. You have to look carefully at how people write the energy in, in this theory. And uh, people so far have, have not distinguished those two things, although they're orthogonal you know, in, in terms of forces. So you're talking about different things, clearly. This is a little picture of the cortex. So now I'm going to go into the cortex. I'm going to try to explain how the cortex creates tension, because as I've explained, this is essential to be able to predict the morphology of two cells and hence of the embryo in total. And this is the work that we did with uh, Maria Leptin. This was a collaboration, and Julio Belmont, you know, she between our two labs. And also our interest is morphogenesis. And so we, uh, we went into the cortex because we didn't know how it behaved. We didn't have any theory to predict the tension of the cortex. This is a picture of the cortex from electron micrograph where we can see the filaments. So these are actin filaments. Right there, you can see uh, elicity maybe, if you look carefully. And um, it's a, a relatively small portion of the cortex. You can see the mesh size is about a few tenths of nanometer. And what you don't see very well in this picture is the crosslink here. But this network is heavily crosslinked. In fact, the filaments are not straight, which you would expect if nothing was crosslinked. And that's not the case. So there are motors, myosin, and crosslink here connecting this cortex. 
And we sort of know, uh, we're starting to know some of the physical characteristics of this network. First of all, it's random. You know, filaments are oriented in every direction, in every, uh, and, and position uniformly. And uh, the persistent length of actin is known. And here, the average length of the filaments is much shorter. You can read in the literature that this would imply that the filament should be straight, but if you look at the picture, you can see that's not true, <laughs> right? So that's because the persistent lens is a measure of how Brownian motion deforms the filaments. And in fact, in this system, it's not Brownian motion, which is the most important force by far, it's the motors. And the mesh size I said already. So now, what I'm going to tell you applies to the cortex, but it applies also to systems of microtubules. And so, uh, you know, the two systems are interesting to compare because the mechanical properties of the filaments are very different. So here, actin filaments, the rigidity is, is so, and the microtubule have yeah, a persistent length of a few millimeters, so extremely rigid. But the filaments are, are polar, and so you have molecular motors moving on them. I probably don't need to dwell too much on that, but uh, since Andrew has given so much information on, on dynein, uh, this is just a picture of a kinesin you know, moving along a microtubule. Okay? We, we know so much, thanks to all the work of Andrew and other people, we know so much how these motors work. And so now, typically what we do in the lab is to use this knowledge to see how, how the mechanism works in the cell. And so, in the cell, there's many complexities. In particular, the cortex is made of filaments which are dynamic. So the actin filament in the cell will grow or shrink, and uh, there is a high turnover of actin filament. But contractility can be reproduced in vitro in experiments where the filaments are static. Right? So here, on top, we have microtubule experiment in which people add taxol, to stabilize the microtubule, and so these filaments don't shrink anymore. So that's much more convenient. We can ignore about dynamics at a first approximation. On the bottom, we have also purified experiment with actin filament made from actin monomers, and uh, in this system, you need to add myosin and a crosslinker. And um, this is a nice movie with uh, an actin system, uh, sorry, microtubule system where dynein is dri driving the contractility. As you can see, very, very nice contractility. It even breaks up with this tension. And on the bottom right, very nice uh, experiment in a vesicle by the group of Kinner Ken with a reconstituted cortex. So the actin is attached to the limit, and um, it's a single slice confocal. So you see the whole thing collapses on onto one side because it contracts. So the message is that we can ignore about dynamics as a first approximation when we want to know why it contracts. And the second message is that we should be able to find a, an explanation that's valid for both microtubule and actin, because they're not so different. There's a different scale, but essentially they are very similar. So there's many open questions. One question is, why do they contract? Uh, you know, rather than expand or do something else. And there are several mechanisms which have been explained, and I summarize that at the end. Um, none of these mechanisms predicts the contractile rate, but this is the first step towards understanding tension that this network made, which is what we need. And now there's a question which is very seldom addressed, which is, can a network expand? You know, you could do a thought experiment and say, well, if the network is contract, what if I change the speed of the motor to go in the other way? Will it expand, you know, by time reversal? And that doesn't happen. I mean, although we can't do the experiment. But, and, uh, and so I'm going to show you, all, though, there are ways to make a network expand without having polymerization of the filaments. And so I... The way we started in those, these questions was to use a, a simulation called Cytosim. I just want to advertise that it's an open source project, so you can actually download it, look at the code, and, and uh, change things if you want. And you should be able to reproduce on your computer 
a simulation like this that will take about a day to compute. Um, this is 3D. The network is uh, confined onto the surface, and it contains a motor and a crosslinker, which is very important. And so we started with this simulation. It contracts very well, and then we said, well, we, you know, because we have it on the computer, we should be able to understand it. And it took us many years, but eventually, we, I think we reached a, a very simple way of explaining what's going on. So that's what I'm going to show you today. So the model is uh, intentionally extremely simple. We have filaments of fixed lens. They are subject to banding elasticity. So these filaments can bend. And if three points are not aligned, we put a, a little force, put it back. And then we have connectors. Uh, the connectors are made of two subunits, A and B. Uh, when they unbound, they diffuse. Now, if they come close to a filament, they can bind. They need to be within a distance epsilon. They can bind with an on rate, this stochastic process. They can also unbind. And because they have two subunits, they can crossing two filaments. Typically, if they cross, they will bind there. Now, among these connectors, so the subunit A or B or both can be motors, and they can be plus undirected motors or minus undirected motors. And so they would add a, a linear force-velocity relationship. They detach immediately at the end, and, uh, but the off rate is constant. We don't put a force-dependent off rate. Now, we don't put steric interactions. Uh, we're going to do most simulation in 2D. So they freely cross. Constant. Oh, yeah, in reality, in, in a real cell, they would grow and shrink. I'll show you a simulation in the end. Well, let's, we, we really try to make it as simple as possible. But we kept banding elasticity, because many models use straight filament. But that, that's too much of a simplification. <laughs> OK, so that, that shows you a, a typical simulation. We throw in filaments in random uh, uh, orientation within the circle, and we add a motor and a crosslinker, and we just simulate. So these motors bind. So the motors in, in blue will start moving, and the whole system will um, contract. Uh, so here, it's, uh, um, it's fairly slow, because we have a lot of frame on the movie, but it, it occurs in a very steady way. In fact, it's, uh, it's exponential, the contraction. Uh, yes, it comes on and off. Is that a term? But it's not force dependent. That's also just for simplicity. If we zoom in a, a bit more, you can see uh, the filament's flexibility. So here, they, we typically equilibrate them uh, before we put in the motors. So the network will, will not contract by just uh, so is the on off rate is uh, force dependent? No. Uh, no. OK, the reason for that is uh, then you can do analytical calculations very easily. And you can compare the simulation with the analytical calculation. And so here you can see uh, the motors are green on this movie. You can see that here is a motor which is tall and it's trying to pull on this side, pulling on the other side. And the whole network is contracting. As the connectors are steady. Don't hesitate to, to ask questions. Now, the first thing we did is to try to reproduce some old experiments. Um, so here we have a, a sort of a, a diagram with the number of crossing here on the x-axis, the number of motors, and each of these box is a simulation with periodic boundary conditions. Now, if you only have, uh, well, let's say if you have nothing, nothing happens, OK, it's clear. If you only have crosslinkers, you make a gel, which is passive. Nothing moves, so it stays like that. It's like rubber. If you only have motors, um, it's active, but it doesn't contract. So you make a network which is, can be very well percolated, but typically it, it will go into a nematic state, so that all the filaments will align, but it doesn't contract. Okay. No, they're not specific. The motors are also not specific. But they bind every crossing in, 
in the same probability. So this is a, a nematic, but what you can see is that if you have both motors and crosslinker together, uh, then it contracts. So here you make this little for sign, it means the entire network had to collapse and contract into a single point. Yeah, so that's, that's a general property of the system. And that with, and uh, well, you have to see that in the simulation, the motors are perfect, right? In experiments, when you prepare motors, there's always a few that are half dead, because these are multi-headed constructs. And so if half of the heads are, are dead, the motor is not going to move the same way if it moves at all. And so I would argue that in a prep, in the experiment which is done in vitro, there's always uh, some amount of costing here, even if, if the system is pure, chemically. Okay? So, what is the color code for those uh, white areas which are, which are surrounding the green one? This? Oh, no, white. white. white the green one. Oh, this? Oh, oh, the motors are green, so they go in the center, and the filaments are, are readily organized around it. So they are like asters? Yes, in this case, yeah. But what's interesting is that, uh, experimentally as well, you need the cross-linker to contract. So this is a very nice experiment from uh, the lab of David Weitz. Myzin on the vertical axis is the motor, the cross-linker alpha actinin, and the cross is a contractile system, and the circle are not contractile system. And also you see uh, intermediate contractility. If you add cross-linkers, it stop contract, and people will say, yes, it's because it's too connected and the motors can't act anymore. But what's surprising is that if you remove cross-linker, it also stops being contractile. And I've, we have other experiments I'll show later to show that. So you need the cross-linker to be contracting. Yes? Uh, we put a, a, an elastic no, a banding, uh, sorry, a stretching stiffness, so it's a hooky and spring. Uh, okay. okay. So, so they don't, the two filaments don't have to cross each other in that sense. Like they can be separated and still cross link. Yes, but in practice in 2D, they almost always cross. I think the, the near miss are very rare events. Okay. Yes. No, no, we just put dimers. But, but we get this property already. So at the end of your simulations, you just get one bunch of uh, microtubules, or you get many, many small, small clusters? Uh, that will depend on the size of the system. And we actually didn't look at this. So you stopped your simulation after a certain time? Yeah, we only look at the, the first second for simplicity. Because then it's simple. In fact, later, there's many, many f interesting things happen, and there's a zoo of things going on. So we didn't want to go into this. So we look at the first second, and there we could, we could come up with a simple expansion. So let me mathematically frame the problem. So given an, a random network, so you throw in filaments, all of the same lens in an area, uniformly uh, and uh, randomly oriented, in all directions, now you add here connectors, I put a, a green and a blue one, but one assumption that we make is that there should be enough connectors for the system to be mechanically percolated, which means that if you pull on one side here, you know, the force is being felt on the other side. So that's a regime which we impose because we think it's the most interesting regime with respect to the cell. That's the regime where the system will be able to exert forces globally rather than just making little asters in the corner. Okay? Now, the question is, if I told you what blue and green do, you know, can you tell me if the network will expand or contract? Okay? And, and we have a, a methodology now, a little theory that allow you to answer the question in one hour or less. Let me explain. Now, there's been a lot of work in the physics community on this type of system, but typically, they take the problem in the other limit. So you, you make a, a mean field theory in which you look at what one motor does on a pair of filaments. 
So that's what you see in all these, these figures. So here, a recent paper, you have a motor between two filaments, and you try to imagine what's going to happen. Okay, you make a little theory, and you extrapolate that to the full system. I think that's very valid if you have very few motors in the system. But it's, it's, it can break down for highly connected network. Because, in fact, what you can see, for instance, is that if you have two filaments, they will rotate. But if you have a very dense network, rotation is not possible because they attach multiple points. So all these theories don't allow you to extrapolate very well to the connected network case, although they're all very interesting. And the second thing is that if you do it this way, you tend to place the motor in the central spot of your theory for good reason, because this is the active element. But then you have a theory which is asymmetric with respect to motors and crosslinker, even though experimentally we know they both need it for contractility. So we're going to make a theory which is symmetric with all the connectors. And so this theory, it's just very, very simple. If you have a dense network which is well connected, by definition, it means that for every filament you take, more or less, there should be two connecting points. Right? And so between those two connecting points, you can define a distance, A. Eh? That's the only thing. And then you can look at what the system will do in time, and this is very simple. Either A remains constant and nothing happens, or A diminishes and you're pulling on the network. So here, all the filaments in gray have been replaced by this graded shading. So we sort of imagine that it's a continuous medium, which responds elastically. And this element is pulling because the two points are approaching each other. So that's pulling. And then, on the uh, contrary, if the elements are moving apart, you're pushing on the system in some way. Except that if the filaments are very flexible, then you may buckle. So here you can see that if you start from this description of the system, there's very few things that can happen. So we can derive a theory like that from these ideas. I can argue for it in a one-dimensional system. So imagine you have a, a bundle which, uh, for simplicity, is closed on itself. Yeah? So it's got a single lens, and uh, it's all well-connected. So you can find a path that goes from uh, all around the bundle through the connectors, and you're going to have to uh, go through one filament, another one, a third one in the opposite way, and et cetera, until you close your loop. So you can write the length of the bundle as the sum of these elementary lengths, A1, A2. And if you have enough of them, if the system is large enough, it's easy to see that all this is going to give you uh, n times A bar, where n is the number of subunits, and A bar is the mean A, you know, the, the average distance between two connectors in the system. You can write that, you can derivate, and then you can use this formula again into this to derive this, which is extremely simple. It means 1 over L dl over dt, which is the percentage at which the full bundle elongate or shrinks, is proportional to the percentage at which the elementary unit shrink or, or, or expand. And so here what we have is we make, to calculate A bar and DA bar over DT, we average over all the configuration and all the pathway. So this is where we make a mean field approximation in physics. Right? We, we think that all the pathway will go through all the configuration in the system. And the nice thing about this theory is that you can do it on a piece of paper in many cases. There's one case which is particularly simple, is when you have a motor and a crosslinker, and they have the same quantity, and we assume also they have the same binding rates. So therefore, you'll be the same amount of bound of this stuff on the network. And so in this case, the four configurations are equally probable. And in addition, the distance A will be the same for all of them. You can, it's just from symmetry, you get that. And so then, to make the sum that I proposed in the slide before, you just need to calculate dA over dt. In this case, the two motors are moving in the same direction at the same speed, so A is not changing. 
So this is an active but a neutral configuration, zero. Here, the motor is approaching the crossing here, which doesn't move. And so this is a contractile configuration with the speed of the motor here, minus V. This is the opposite. So it's extensile plus V. And this is neutral because it's static. And so the theory says you just need to sum up these four numbers. But remember, we had two cases. Either the filaments are very rigid, and you sum all of these numbers because the rigid filament will be able to push. And that gives you zero. So we predict the system is not contractile, not expansile. But if the filaments are flexible, we think that this configuration will buckle. And so we replace plus by v, but, uh, plus v by zero. And so, of course, if you do that, you predict that it's only going to be contractile or not contractile. OK, so very flexible filament, according to this theory, either contractile or they don't move, but they can never expand. OK, so very simple prediction on paper. We could verify that with simulation, because that also is quick. On the left side, we have a simulation with rigid filaments, like microtubules. You have motors and crosslink here. And the motors are pulling and pulling and pushing, but exactly in the same amount uh, in different configurations. So that cancels out exactly, and the system is not moving. It's active, but it's stuck dynamically stuck. On the right-hand side, the only thing we change is the flexibility of the filaments. So we make them flexible, and then they can buckle. So half the configurations will buckle, and the other half will contract the system. And you can see uh, now, you can see the very smooth contraction. It's actually exponential, but we can uh, um, measure it in the simulation. So, now, that was the simplest case in which we could apply the theory, but we can also apply it in the semi-flexible case where the filaments may buckle or not, depending on the lens they are. But this is a little bit more complicated, but here we have a threshold, beta zero, and all these configurations on the left are shorter, and they don't buckle. And so here we have, for every pulling configuration, we have an equivalent pushing configuration by symmetry, and the two of them are in the same number, and so they cancel out. But above the buckling threshold, the planets buckle in this pushing configuration, so they don't cancel out, so they contract. So if we calculate the probability of this configuration, we end up with this formula, where PMPC is calculated from the number of molecules in the system. I'm not going to show you the formula, but it's really like basic binding and binding kinetics of a network that you know. So you have this formula in which we have one fitting parameter beta, and that turns out to fit very well, extremely well, the simulation output. So here we have one uh, beta fitting parameter, which tells us you know, at what stage the filament buckle. And uh, you can see extremely good fit in this case. It's not always as good. So here we have a, a network which is a little bit looser, with fewer filaments. It looks like this. And uh, the points are the simulation output. I forgot to say that. And the line is the analytical theory. Here the fit is not so good. And we're still working on improving the theory to uh, finding cases where it doesn't work and, and uh, trying to define that. But here, at least we can predict the contractile rate qualitatively as a function of how many motors and cross linkers you have in the system. There's even experiments what, that you can use to verify that. So this is an experiment from uh, a colleague of mine, so Laurent Blanchoin, uh, together with... So they have a group together in, in Grenoble, and they do a lot of micro-patterning experiments. So this is a micro-pattern ring of actin. So you micro-pattern the actin nucleator, and you make sure the actin will only grow on this ring. Then you throw in myosin. It's a myosin-6 in this case. But this ring will not contract. You can see after 40 minutes, it has the same size. And in fact, the filaments are turning in the ring, but it doesn't contract. But again, if you add alpha actinin, which is a cross-linker, it contracts. So you can see the radius of the ring diminishes, collapses into an aster. 
The same thing here, you can do this experiment, repeat it at different concentration of alpha actin in, and you get this curve, alpha actin concentration, the contractility, and you can see this, again, the same plot. No contraction without crosslinker, some optimal contraction, and then a, a decreased contraction, which is exactly the same trend that we predict from this theory. Yeah, in this system, everything is determined by the connection in the network. So you have the filament elasticity, and the connectors are short with respect to everything else. And so the only thing that matters is, is all the configurations you can build. So that's our point of view, at least. And I, I'm going to show you a system that expands, if that's what you're interested in. Well, the big... I would say the basic reason is flexibility. If you have actin, which are very flexible, the only thing you can do is pull. You... Yes, the stiffer they make, the filament. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, let me uh, now, in, in the last seven minutes, broaden um, a little bit the, the type of network we're looking at. Because I've looked at, I focused on this network, which is made of connectors cross-linkers, and motors. And that's what you find in the cortex. But you can imagine many other types of networks because the actin cytoskeleton has more stuff to it than just motors and connectors. In particular, so, you know, there's cross-linker, there's myosin-2, which is this mini filament with multiple heads. Myosin-6 is a smaller motor. It moves in the other direction. So with actin, we also have plus and, and minus undirected motors. So you could play with that. But we also have the end tracking, like formin will uh, hitchhike on the uh, barbed end of the filament. And up to three, I know it's a nucleator, but let's ignore filament dynamic. I think we could summarize that as being something that binds on the side attached to something that binds to the end. Okay? I know it's not exactly true, but if we ignore the filaments are growing, this would be what's remain uh, of, of it. And so what we did is have five activities, a minus n binder. It only binds to the minus n and stays stuck there until it unbinds. We have the minus n motor. It moves everywhere and moves to the minus n. We have the binder binds everywhere. It doesn't move. And the opposite are symmetric on the other side. And so we have five activities. We can already make 15 different possible uh, couples or, you know, um, uh, you know, connectors made of two of these guys. And so we ask uh, Julio to make all the possible prediction first. And so he predicted, for instance, that this system with a minus motor attached to the minus end of the filament will contract, but the plus motor attached to the minus end will expand. And there's a symmetry. If the filaments are not growing, everything is symmetric. So this behaves like that. And then we did the simulation, and they were all confirmed. In fact, I lied to you, the simulation before we did the prediction, to be honest. You should be... <laughs> but it's always tempting in front of a nice audience to... So again, in this case, you're not considering the dynamic instability and branching, right? No, no branching. Yeah. And so here we have rigid filaments in which we predict extensile network. So here they expand despite the fact that there's no filament assembly. So it's just because the motor are pushing in the right direction. So this is an anti-sarcomeric system, but the sarcomeric system is very ordered, whereas this is a disordered network. But it makes connections which are symmetric to the sarcomeric system. So that's rigid filaments. In the case of flexible filament, we only predict contraction, but at different rates. And so in fact, uh, we can also predict why this is faster than this, which is then faster than this. You see this, there's this order. This is the fastest, this is the second fastest, and this is uh, still contractile. And uh, it's because this has twice as many motors. So you could say twice as much activity, this is why it's faster. And that's true. But this one has one motor, this one has the same amount of motors, but this is faster than this one. It's because it's in, in a better configuration to contract because it's attached to the minus end of the filament, whereas this is attached everywhere. So 
But among these, there are a few configurations like that that makes it contractile. So we can predict the contractile rate. Excuse me. Um, it, it looked like a couple of those were actually extensile, like uh, at the upper right. Yeah. That one. Yeah, this is because we, we, for this simulation, we took the flexibility of actin. And um, the theory in the case of uh, infinitely flexible filament will predict that it never expands. But in the case of finite bending elasticity like actin, they can still expand a little bit. So this is a configuration that we predict is expansile. In fact, it only has expansile configuration, and they are mostly killed by the bending elasticity, buckling, except not 100% killed. So you still get a little bit of expansile. Yeah, there's a threshold. It's still buckled, but it's still able to expand a little bit. Uh, these are not attached, so they're freely uh, contractile, they, they're free network. This is also a, a simpler assumption. So now we can make 15 uh, types of connectors. We can mix two connectors together, so that's 15 times 15 divided by 2. And there's a bunch of symmetry, so about 100 um, unique simulations. So we have a table here on top. What is the prediction for rigid filaments and what is the prediction for flexible filament? So we can predict that if you take a, a plus motor with a plus and binder and you mix it with a, a minus and binder to itself, so it's sort of like making a sarcomeric kind of stuff, then it should be expansive. So we have uh, all these kind of predictions. And I'm not going to show you 100 movies, but we can make a plot like this. And black square are the ones where nothing happens, right? Uh, uh, the dots are nothing we predict is statics. They don't contract, they don't expand. Yeah. And uh, so here we have on the x-axis, we have the prediction of the theory, which is uh, calculating the, the mean dA bar of dt and the result of the simulation. And we have a, a very good um, correlation. It's not 100% perfect. 100 perfect. There's still room for improvement. But we think of it as a, you know, a, a first order theory of, of what's going on in the simulation. Here we have, in red, the system made of rigid filaments, and they can be expansile or contractile, whereas the system in blue of made of flexible filament are all contractile, but with different rates, and that we understand. Uh, here we can predict uh, that they are more or less contractile. So I promise that I conclude by some mechanisms, and if Maybe some of you know the market tubule and the acting literature, and these are people who like each other, but they rarely read each other's paper. You know, there's the market tubule field and the acting field, and they don't cite, cross cite very, very little. And so what's funny about this is that the mechanism that's been proposed for market tubule uh, system, uh, which is on the bottom, is quite dramatically different from the mechanisms that's been proposed for acting. Okay? And it's, I mean, these mechanisms are, are correct, but I just want to say that our theory puts everybody on the same footage. And so it's just reformulating this mechanism in a way that looks equivalent. So I told about the sarcomeric system, which is what you have in your muscles. So here the filaments are organized into anti-parallel filaments, and, and the myosin motors are also anti-parallel bundles. And so if you look at this image, it's easy to convince yourself that it's going to be contractile and nothing else. But what we're saying is that you can also break it down into the components and build the list of connectors. Here, you can have a neutral connection, uh, a pulling connection, and a static connection. And because there's only one pulling connection and no pushing whatsoever, the system is always going to be able to contract and nothing else. OK? And uh, that applies also to more disorganized systems for which the case is much less clear. So this is smooth muscles or maybe the cytokinetic contractile ring in the cell is thought to be like this. Uh, and we have totally disorganized network. With the same elements, but filaments are totally disconnected. And uh, this is the prominent mechanism for contractility in actin, which we can also explain, but I, I already explained it, so I'm not going to go again through that but uh, it, it contracts because there is buckling. And in the market, you will feel the 
Compatel mechanism requires that the motors reach the end of the filament and stay put there for a little while. So this is called the halting principle, and that allows for contractility. And in fact, we can uh, recap, explain it also by just looking at the configurations. And if you look at the configuration, they're exactly the same as the sarcomeric. It's interesting, we can see similarities between a system that looks very different. And in fact, if you look at the microscopic configuration in the system, it's exactly the same ones. That's possibly why these two systems contract always in a very reliable way. So in summary, I think we, if you have a random network, uh, there is a, a new way to look at it, which is to look at the bridges, what uh, one filament with two connectors is doing. Because that's a very nice way that will allow you, you to extrapolate to the very dense connected network, which is the interesting one, particularly in the cortex. So we validated this theory extensively with simulation. I showed you some experiments, and uh, in fact, all the experiments we have uh, found in the literature uh, uh, in agreement with what we predict. It unifies previously theory, so that's very good because now we have a, a unifying way to think about microtubular acting system. And we can predict network contraction. So this is new. People have predicted that it should contract, but they didn't predict the contractile rate, whereas we can give you a rate as a function of, for instance, the density, the length of the filaments, or the connection. And I'm I'm going to skip some of the stuff to acknowledge the people. Uh, so the first part, morphogenesis, with work of Hervé Turlier, collaboration with uh, Jean-Léon Maître and the lab of Takeshi Hiragi. And the second part of the contractile network is the, mostly the work of Julio Belmonte, who's been a, a, a postdoc chair with Maria Leptin. It's been a very enjoyable uh, collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, in that filament, if we take some, uh, you are taking combination of some uh, soft filament and some are rigid, and uh, if even the motor is contract, uh, like pulling, don't you get in 2D some uh, high force and low force region because of that asymmetric force distribution? Yeah, I mean, what we did is just the beginning, and what you're asking is uh, there are many directions, exciting directions to go to. Uh, you can... Uh, um, Two model kind of stuff like no. So we have we have tested and developed the model um, for one type of filament. You can do a, a system in which you have a mixture of of uh, stiff and flexible filaments. You will need to redo all the calculations to be able to derive your your prediction. And um, I believe the the procedure you would follow to make the calculation is going to be the same, or pretty much the same, but of course the calculation would be much more complicated. So all these are things that people, maybe you, uh, will do in the future. Uh, it was too, we cannot do that yet. So I cannot tell you if it's going to work or not. I think it's an interesting direction to try, definitely. So how much time will it take for, uh, let's say, a graduate student to learn the cytosine? How much will it take a graduate No, how much time will it take? To learn cytosine? Yeah. Uh, one week or... I mean, just running it is one day. No, running is fine. <laughs> fine, but learning... I mean, I think what uh, if... The cytosine is a project which can simulate, you know, uh, endocytosis and spindle and so... What I should do, and if you all vote for it, maybe I'll do it, um, would be to scheme it down, you know, scheme it to only what you need to do this. Because then um, people would be more comfortable with the code, it would be much smaller, just what you need, and I think that would help a lot. But it, it is a large project, it is very well organized and, and documented, but of course there is a learning curve for that. But uh, I, would, I would argue that it's still shorter to learn than to develop your own code from scratch, okay? Uh, you can't ask, no. It's 120,000 uh, lines. It's C++. I mean, we, again, I think we could shrink it down to 20,000 just to do that. 
And uh, you know, it's not so much because, like, you know, there is a matrix class which will take, you know, 3,000 lines, and you don't need to look at this. And there's a vector class. I mean, and uh, you know, there are things like this that uh, work. So, so we have because we didn't, or yeah, at some point we decided to write our own because we, you know, the library were not sufficient. But um, the the core of it, it can be much smaller. The names that are given to this sort of abstract ones, how to connect them to the real motors? Yeah, um, this is where it starts to be very interesting. So in the biology, so in a cell, you have many crosslinkers um, and not only one myosin, you know, active in one particular system. And so people wonder why you have five different crosslinkers, and it may be that they're regulated at different stages, and it, and they also have different properties. So in the actin world, there are connectors that are long and floppy, and so they can bind the cross points. And you have connectors which are very stiff and short, and so they only bind maybe parallel, and other that only bind anti-parallel. So they all have different properties, and, and they come in different amounts, and they may be regulated differently. So all this is still to be analyzed. So even in the biological community, we just don't understand yet exactly what is the impact of this costing cure. But part of it is, is our fault, because the, in, in the physics theory, which is uh, you know, the connectors were sort of on the side, was the motor at the central role, but I think the connectors have an equally interesting role in this system than the motors. Connectors. Yeah. There are some active connectors. See if we have to sort of take those. For example, in the oh. interpolar region, we have these two kinds of crosslinkers, right? So if we have to make connection by doing simulation with those experiments, so for each of these, how to, how to proceed? So you say active connectors, um, so they're active in what sense? The, the off rate maybe is triggered by... ATP hydrolysis yeah, ability, but, so... Right, but what do they do with this ATP? Ah, ultimately, they have force-dependent attachment detachment rates also. So that can be modeled, and uh, yes, that can be very important. In fact, if you take a, well, a contractile system, you need to change the geometry to... Uh, make it unable to contract, and then if you put some uh, force-dependent off-rate, uh, you can make it oscillatory. So there's a lot of papers like this that have shown this. So, so I think the, so this type of behavior are, are very crucial, and we, we took it out from our studies because we knew there would be uh, a lot of complicated phenomena if we allowed that. And so for simplicity, we took it out, but of course, this is still to be add it back again and see what effect it would have. That's very interesting directions to go again. I guess I wanted to come back to your first topic, morphogenesis, and how surface tension is regulated. Um, so you've, so contractility gives you a mechanism to increase surface tension, uh, and, but volume is constrained within each cell, right? So the volume cannot change, so essentially you just increase the, the surface tension without the surface area yep. changing. Um, but you also have to maintain homogeneity in the cortex. Uh, is it obvious that that should happen? I mean, in many of your simulations, it looks like it becomes quite heterogeneous, and in some experiments as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a very important point. So if you take a cortex made of static filaments, it will contract to a point. And that doesn't happen in the cell, because at the same time, contracting the filament will depolymerize. New filaments are nucleated uh, everywhere, or we think, so you fill in the gaps. And so that's, we think that's what's necessary to avoid the collapse, which would be bad in terms of morphogenesis, but it gives rise to very interesting dynamic, as you can see here. So this is what you see in the cell if you look at the actin filaments. The left is C. elegans first cell stage. This is the tissue on the right. But you see um, uh, yeah, things pulsating, moving. Anyway, so, and uh, apart from this idea that, that prevents collapse, we don't really know 
why that would be useful for the cell. Well, why not? Maybe it's just an epiphenomena. We don't know. So do you have plans to integrate this into your modeling, this type of uh, turnover and polymerization dynamics? Yeah. So this is a simulation in which we uh, delete a filament randomly, no matter where it is, and we add another one randomly with a certain rate. So again, this is a very simplistic scenario in which it, the, the turnover doesn't depend on the state or the force or anything. It's just imposed by God on the system. And, um, but you still get lots of patterns. So now we go into yeah, very complex patterning phenomena, dynamic phenomena. I mean, to, so we're thinking about this, but to tell you, we, we, we don't even know how to quantify the system here. So it's very difficult. You can yeah, you could define things like what is the area of these regions that are expanding, how many foci you get, and what's the lifetime. But there's no. I mean, I would like to have a number, and instead it seems that we cannot do it. We, we're going to have a bunch of descriptions. I don't know if anybody of you has. Yeah, things are flowing differently. So I'd be happy to discuss with any of you if you have thoughts about this. But this is, yeah, I think the next step is going to be much more complicated. You are quoting some like uh, surface tension values which are without context and with context some numbers. So these are experimental numbers? Yes, they are measured. So how do they do it when the constant um, polymerization and deprimation going on? How do they? Do this measurement? No, so this is the this is dynamic cortex, and you you come with an AFM tip, except it doesn't have the, the pyramid, you know, it's flat, and so you press the cell, you measure the force, and you with a if you watch it with a microscope, you can also measure the surface area of the contact, and you know the volume of the cell, and you can calculate. I see. Do they also calculate bending modulus that way, and this uh, in the cortex? Well, so we. Uh, I think that's exactly what they did because you, you can then compare, you know, do this and, and uh, estimate. And uh, you should read the paper, but I, I think what comes up is that it's the tension that dominates and the bending uh, is not going to be very dominant because, you know, if you compress the cell, then the, the cortex turns over. So the new cortex that reforms will reform in with the bending, the bands of that cell. So it's not going to be Imagine. not pre-stressed. Uh, in, in terms of banding. So I think the banding, or at least we forgot it intentionally in our theory because we think it's, it's not going to be very dominant. I, I didn't make it in the slide. But uh, everything seems to be explainable with a surface tension. And that's a miracle, but it's the way it is. So how do you... In a, uh... Uh, yeah, um, it's an interesting, very good question. I just want to point out, here is a clattering coated pit. Uh, so here's another one. So it, it just seems the pore are just big enough to uh, have. So yeah, you, so this is uh, endocytosis going through. And you, you're talking about protein, but is even smaller. So I would, oh, so here is endocytosis. So yeah, very good question. But uh, this, yeah, it seems the pore are big enough. Well, yeah, there are other processes by which the cell engulf, you know, very large. Exactly, exactly. So, and, and, but, but they're dependent on actin, and, and so, you know. It's... Yeah, all these are uh, extremely interesting, complicated question. You know, people look at uh, cytokinesis, by which the cell will make a, a ring that contracts. But in fact, in cell against the cytokinetic ring forms by having the cortex flowing into the cleft and bundling up to make the ring. So, so the, the cytokinetic ring is an emanation of the cortex dynamic, which then, are, you know, as it's bundling, other types of crossing can bind. And so you change the nature of it, but uh, initially it, it's just cortex, cortex flowing in. So all these things are connected, of course, and uh, yeah, <laughs> lots of work. Thank you very much for your questions.